first thing I wanted to talk about is the difference between what we'll be talking about, the difference between dependence and addiction. Um, because when we talk about someone being dependent on a drug, that is a term of um, meaning that the body has become dependent physiologically on a drug. When we talk about physiological dependence, there's also psychological dependence. But when we talk about physiological dependence, that means once the drug is stopped, there's going to be predictable physical withdrawal symptoms. So um, certain drugs like with heavy alcohol use, if there's a physical dependence, they're going to have um, some heavy withdrawal symptoms. We know that from opioids, if someone's been taking them for a period of time, there is um, predictable withdrawal sy symptoms depending on how much they've been using. Um, where addiction is could be psychological or physical dependence, and it's the compulsive use, loss of control, and continued use despite adverse consequences. So that's what we talk about, the difference between dependence and addiction. So for those terms, that's what I wanted to clarify as we get started. With addiction also, um, this is where when someone first starts, they go from liking the drug to wanting the drug to needing the drug. And the compulsive, the compulsion in addiction is different than like obsessive compulsive disorder. Compulsion in addiction is an irresistible urge to behave in a certain way against one's conscious wishes. So that's the, the compulsion that we're talking about because when people become addicted, they have a compulsion even though they may not plan to use, they may not want to use, but that compulsion drives them to that use. So we'll talk more about that. <clears throat> So you probably heard people say, well, I don't know why they just don't stop. And I've heard people say that. They could stop if they wanted to. And that's not true. Not when we look at the addicted brain. Um, because addiction does change the brain. Let's look at this sign. Depending on where you are, <laughs> if you're in the United States, I'm not sure if they have Krispy Kreme in other countries, but in uh, the United States, I think we have Krispy Kreme donuts everywhere in the United States. And those of you that are familiar with this sign, when you saw this sign, if you like donuts, how did that make you feel? Um, <clears throat> for those of you that know Krispy Kreme, Krispy Kreme um, turns on the light when the donuts are coming off the, off the, um, out of the oven or off the whatever, how they make them. And not only if you're close to it and you see that sign, you can probably smell them too. And um, it may, for some people, start a craving. And that is the purpose of that sign. The marketing people of Krispy Kreme knew exactly what they were doing when they developed that sign. It's the sight of the sign, the smell of the donuts, it triggers the brain to recognize, ooh, that tastes good, I want a donut. And it starts that, that process in the brain, brain of the possibility of getting a reward. The reward being a hot, gooey, sugary donut. So what it does, it's acting in the limbic system of the brain. And that's what marketing strategies are built on. If you think about beer commercials, for someone who really likes beer, they see a beer commercial and I would be willing to bet that a lot of people that when they see a beer commercial, they, even without thinking about it, if they don't have a beer in their hand, may get up to go to the refrigerator to get a beer. Or they may think, oh, I got to go to the grocery store here in a little while. I'm going to get me a six pack of beer. That's what those marketing strategies are built on. It's the limbic system where we have that, the dopamine in our brain. And that's the feel good chemical, the thing that makes us feel good. Um, it is highly reinforcing. So it's whenever we see the reward or we think about the reward, it starts releasing dopamine. Dopamine. Probably if you're getting ready to go out to eat 
and you know that you're going to your favorite place, favorite restaurant to eat. And when you are going to that restaurant and on the way to the restaurant, there's a good chance that your brain has started already developing dopamine or releasing dopamine. And if you get close to it and you see the restaurant, your brain may release even more dopamine. You look at the menu and you start planning, oh, this is what I want. This, this is so good. I really like this. Your brain is already releasing dopamine. What, the, what it tells the brain is, that feels good. Let's do it again. Um, at this point, the brain is full of wanting for whatever that is, for whatever the thing that feels good. The brain is full of wanting that, and that's the cravings. Now, this is very powerful in our brain. This system is help, helps us to survive. And the chemicals and nerve cells in our brain that keep us alive can also make certain people addicted. So what happens in this reward circuit? It makes sure that we do things to keep us alive, such as eating, drinking water, drinking liquids, reproducing, and it triggers that executive center in our brain, which is in that frontal lobe, to remember how to achieve the reward. And that same drive that keeps us alive is the same drive that the drugs of abuse hijack. And the frontal lobe is where that stop system is. So in the go system, that reward system, in the limbic system, there is a balancing act between that and the frontal lobe. So for people that are not addicted, we know when to stop. Okay, we may really, really like those donuts, but after one or two donuts, the our frontal lobe, that stop system in the brain goes, okay, that's enough, you don't need any more. But for that person that's addicted, it's like the brakes are cut. That stop system doesn't work. And it the reward system just keeps going. So it's we lose that balance. So actually our brain is programmed to take action, any action necessary to achieve the reward. And that's where the dopamine is released. So you've got the dopamine in that um, nucleus accumbens, and that's where those dopamine cells are. That's where we feel pleasure. The amygdala and the hipp hippocampus are the two areas that plays a role in memory and whether or not the experience is desirable. So we've always heard about, you know, that first kiss. It was so wonderful the first time someone's ever kissed and they remember that experience and they always look for that first kiss again. Well, it's the same thing with someone who begins using drugs. It has this wonderful feeling and it feels good the first time they do it. And that is what keeps them going back because that memory is so strong. And this is where it's not just the drug itself. It's the memory that is instilled. And this is where we talk about why people relapse, because even if they haven't used for three years and something triggers them so strongly, that memory is there. That memory of, I know how this will feel. I know how to fix this problem and feel better. I can go and use something. And it's that memory that is the, the big part of relapse. Um, and then the prefrontal cortex, that's where it coordinates all that information and determines our behaviors, our personality, right from wrong, judgment, inhibitions, all of that is in that frontal lobe the prefrontal cortex. And so this is the, the where the, it doesn't have that stop in it. So again, it kind of goes offline. It's like driving a car and someone cuts your brake line and you step on the brakes, but it doesn't work. And so that's kind of what's going on in the brain once a person becomes addicted. Um, Again, for those people that are not addicted to whatever it is, to the drug, 
to food, to gambling, to whatever that reward is for them. Um, people that are addicted don't have that ability to stop that most people do that are not addicted. That balance is there. And I'm going to show you a picture of this. So you see on the left, the non-addicted brain. And the saliency is that event that happens. That's when um, the something, the triggering event, we'll call it. Well, you'll see on the left, there's a balance between the memory and the control. And the the drive is is there, but it's not that big. So there's a stoplight. There, there's the stoplight that stays there. On the addicted brain, you see the impact of that triggering event, the saliency. And you see the drive is magnified and the memory is much stronger. And there's very little control. The control is a lot smaller. So this is what we're talking about, how addiction changes the brain from the non-addicted brain to the addicted brain.